Alright, so here I am in uh, part 11, and um, just did a expose on the resurrection, and um, I wanted to kind of put some finishing touches on that, we'll have a resurrection roundup, because there's a lot of huge implications going on. And, you know, the good thing is that we've got um, a lot of, you know, preceding material that I want to keep us reminded of so that we get the full context. A lot of times we just get bits and pieces if we're even getting that. So let me just uh, kind of remember to bring this up just so I can kind of reference it. Okay, so, as I said, all right, so part one, we dealt with um, the religious need for Jesus. We have a, a context, and um, I don't remember, so I have to kind of look back over, but um, it's, it's good to know that there are a lot of, you know, studies that have been done on this. Um, there is a a morality that has become part of the human psyche when we kind of understand that um, there was a lot of work from the uh, Jungian school of psychology that deals with um, the symbolisms I've got two books one is kind of more contemporary and then one is Let's see here. Okay, here it is. Boy. Okay, so this one's called From Young to Jesus. It's an older book. Myth and Conscious in the New Testament by Gerald Slusser. Let's see how old it is. Uh, 1986, okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Gerald Slusser here, he talks about these symbols and the mythology, so he's not like a conservative, but like um, that kind of being a part of the mind, and I'm trying to remember the psychological language. You, you know it if you've studied Jungian psychology, but um, basically um, these, these symbols in our mind kind of dictate a form of morality and understanding and one major part is that there is a uh, I think this is still him um, a Christ consciousness um, you know today a contemporary to this message is Jordan Peterson who um, although I don't know he's he's playing around with Christianity he's probably more of a Gnostic than anything else but um, he believes in the positivity of Christian religion. And he really encourages Christian religion, whether or not you actually believe. And so um, that goes along with that Jungian side of things. And then there's some um, apologists who've been focusing on the moral argument for God in the abduct abductive form, and that's a David Baggett and uh, Mary Beth, uh, his wife, they came together to write this book. It's called The Morals of the Story. And essentially, um, what you start to find composed is that there is a morality. There's um, not only an evil, because sometimes we get too much focused on, you know, what's ultimately the most evil, you know, but there's also a good. And so there's there's an inherent um, knowledge of good and evil within humanity. So as we start to see that develop, and we also have the needs for, we have a need for goodness. You know, we, we don't like evil, and we do like good. And, you know, so the story of Jesus in many forms, uh, but in the, you know, lowest common denominator, is, you know, in us. And if it's in us, then there's a, you know, a God-shaped hole in people's heart. You know, so so we, we start off with that, and then we um, 
move on to you know the proof and I went through a little while on this um, the proof of Jesus in his historical existence um, so there's a spiritual need and some liberals they uh, take a in theology what we call an historian position they have uh, two Jesuses the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith but uh, yes so we do have this you know need for the Christ of faith and we also have a Jesus of history and then um, you know I talk about the fame of Jesus how did he become that it's easy for us to um, you know say oh well this is that way and it's you know but exactly how did he out of all of humanity become this figurehead you know um, uh, you know guy who kind of wandered the earth homeless for most of that which made him famous. Um, you know, a, a poor, you know, son of a carpenter 2,000 years ago. This is, um, the next um, section I did was, um, I started talking about the philosophy that justifies miracles and supernatural. And I know that comes up again, but, um, you know, we have to understand that you know, if there's no God, then how does science work? <laughs> how do you know that there are these rules of matter and rules of, you know, the gravity is always going to be there. And science is always going to be there because matter is always going to do the bidding. And, you know, really, we have no proof of that. You know, we're, we're thinking that there is an order. Well, who put the order together? You know, if there is laws, then there has to be a lawgiver. There has to be intelligence. So um, you can find that. You can find design. You know, you call it a bunch of different things, but it it is something that is not just you know slab rock. You know, we we understand the the universe a lot better now, so we know that there's an order to things. There's an intelligence behind things, and so. You know, if there is a thought behind the universe, then who thought it? Okay, so um, we go into uh, the uh, Gospels as um, they are historical sources. Uh, I am going very easy at this point. Uh, yes, I believe in the inspiration and the inerrancy of the Bible more so than most of the proponents that you here on a popular level. Most apologists are much more liberal than I am. But, um, you know, there's always a first step. So, you know, we want to we wanna just grant some basics, okay? Before you, you know, um, swallow the camel, <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to start talking about the gnat. So, um, basically, um, the, um, it basically is a his history. It's a historical resource and um, you know we go through some various different arguments for that then um, you know part six we so, we show that Jesus has a prophetic supernatural knowledge and we start off with the long-term prophecies of the gospel and his word and how it would reach the entire earth that's not something that anybody can really claim that well and you know there's been you know Buddha and Joseph Smith and um, the um, Muhammad, you know, I mean, a couple of guys can either get close or something to that, but, you know, when you kind of think about, you know, the, the fame of Jesus, um, there, there's nothing comparative to that. So, basically, him predicting that that would happen is something, is a knowledge that nobody else can claim. You know, so, because uh, it requires all that kind of cooperation. So, um, then you look at some of his closer prophecies. Um, him prophesying the um, fall of Jerusalem, and then him prophesying his uh, death, burial, and resurrection. Once again, not an easy claim to make, you know. But, you know, this, this is what's going to happen to me. <laughs> so, um then we talk about the universal nature of Jesus as a teacher. And then I go, uh, I take an older 
uh, video I did on Jesus being the Messiah, and we go over some of the prophecies that are just mind blowing as far as like you know how much it ultimately points to Jesus as the Messiah. So you know we we go through that part, and then uh, I dealt with Jesus and the priests, these little things that all really directly point to you know who would we understand Jesus to be today. But it's all embedded in the Gospels um, so long ago. And, um, you know, things that we wouldn't think is obvious. And, you know, when you think about how, you know, a Gospel conspiracy would be put together, you need geniuses. And the Twelve Apostles just were not the geniuses. All right. So then the last one, we went through our case on the resurrection. I want to kind of hit a little bit of points. I know that I was getting um, pretty fatigued, and, you know, that's so that was fighting me. And also, um, just to kind of get us past that needle, a lot of people get stuck at, because you have a lot of the evidence already laid out there. It's It's obvious, but yet, at the same time, um, there is a cognitive dissonance, and we think, well, it's just, it's just not enough because it's not breaking my rule. And you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, you you have subconscious doctrines, and so if you've made something subconsciously a doctrine, then you know you, somebody can prove you wrong, and yet you're going to say, well, I'll figure something out later. <laughs> And I remember uh, there was a young man, and I was probably younger than him at that time, but many years ago I came across this guy in my neighborhood. We went through all these issues for about 40 minutes. And um, then, like, after we got done, and basically I answered every one of his arguments, and really just, I mean, it was just obvious. He, you know, I had everything taken care of there. And, he just asked me the exact same questions all over again. <laughs> it's like, you know, just recycle, you know. So, you know, what happens is that, you know, people have this base subliminally. And so sometimes you're not going to, you know, make it across there. But at the same time, um, it is what it is. And sometimes you just got to put this stuff together. So, uh, um, Later, um, some of the lessons later are going to reinforce this. It's just that we're we're looking for a logical order here to get across that base. You know, we're we're gonna we're gonna you know maximize the case because um, it really is like um, it, sometimes it's hard for people. It's one thing if you're taught from the time you're a child. It's another th thing if you spent every year of your life operating with a rejection, you know, at the start of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's it's definitely something that you notice, not just in the atheist community, but in the Jewish community. I've heard Jews say that the one thing that they were sure of is that they don't believe in Jesus. <laughs> you know, they, they could not be so big into their own faith, they might not be big into the Bible. Uh, one Jewish person told me that, um, you know, they had all these different rules and lots of stuff on cooking and worship procedures, you know, but they never got around to a big bulk of the Old Testament. They just, you know, there's just some, you know, you get those five books and the rest of them, well, well you know, maybe when you're an adult, <laughs> maybe when you have like this large giant commentary set, you know, then we'll get you ready for that. So. Um, yeah, you know, indoctrination is a, is a tough thing, and so that's why, you know, we have this larger series, because we want to still work on some of these people. And also, it's good for any of you who are believers, that you understand the reasoning that's gone behind this. All right, so, um, you know, two key passages I want to focus on, and then just reiterate some points that we already had. So, First John 1. All right, so this is an epistle written by um, the Apostle John, uh, who 
among other titles, was called the Beloved of Christ, okay? He was, you know, uh, if Jesus had a best friend, it would have been John. And he says, um, verse 1, and, and by the way, when we think about this, these epistles, these were letters. They were not wrapped up in, you know, a nice big leather bound, right? They, they're, they're not like that. They are, you know, letters individually written. And then, you know, um, people had come to the understanding of who they were, but they weren't all bound together into one just perfectly done book um, for a couple centuries. And even that, you know, uh, trying to figure out which book, you know, I, I believe that the, uh, the book uh, for the English-speaking people is the King James Version. But, um, you know, this is not something that they initially had. But this is a good thing in this way because this helps us understand, like, this was written, you know, right here, this is written by John. But John wrote it, and here it is for you. Then uh, the, uh, the epistles of Paul, you know, he writes this, and here it is for you. You know, so um, if I'm writing a letter, you know, you know it's for me. <laughs> the whole point of the letter is that it's written for me. So, okay. Go ahead and look at this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Now, it's important to know, um, John is speaking to Asian uh, Christians, I believe. And, you know, he's developing the post-Jewish, you know, what is a Christian post-Judaism? You know, because Christians now, you know, they're being, they've got tons of Gentile converts, and they know they're not under the dispensation of Moses. So, you know, what does that look like? And so that's part of John's mission. Well, um, they, you know, these people who were formerly Gentile, they know things like the Platonic philosophy. And the Platonic philosophy was looking to the Logos. They were looking to the Word, the knowledge. And so this is what the Gnostics are looking for, that knowledge, these mystery religions. And, you know, there's something special there. You know, and it's beyond the simple heathen, you know, idol worship. But there's... There's a knowledge that God has so that we can know God. And so, you know, there's a play upon that. But the Word um, is manifested with us. So we think about the Word according to the Torah uh, or the law. And then now the Word has become flesh and has dwelt among us in the form of Jesus Christ. And so um, the things that the great philosophers were yearning towards and thinking of, you know, now we see the idea that was on their mind. God is trying to reach their hearts, and unfortunately, the non-born-again heart is convoluted and gets things messed up, but still God reaches out to them. So now he has shown that this is what it is, okay? We're, we're going to find the truth, the truth that goes beyond just, you know, your color coloring books, you know, but it's the, the word, you know, and the word of life. So for the life was manifest and we have seen it, bear witness to it. Okay, you know, oh, you're talking about physically handling? What? And bear witness and share unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Wow. The word, the life, physically, man, what is going on here? That which we have seen, okay, and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father. Who's the Father? God. And with his Son, Jesus Christ. So this historical man, Jesus Christ, is 
the one that we meant. And these things that we that write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. All right, I'll cut off there. So this is the, the issue of the eyewitness, okay? Um, the apostles really did, they, they, they really, as earnestly as they could, tell you that this is what it's about, you know? Their life, their existence has just been about this, about this light, about this life. And this was in a person that they met. And then the Apostle Paul has this to say. Moreover, brethren, I, who's I? It's the Apostle Paul, declare unto you the gospel, gospel's word for good news, which I preached unto you, okay? So I've taught you this gospel, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. So this is Paul talking to believers, by which ye are saved. All right, so this is the good news that has saved you. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. You have to remember what you're believing in, okay? And so, you know, this, this good news to remember. Um, I preached unto you unless you believe, have believed in vain. Okay, so, you know, this is the condition. You have to believe this. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Okay, so, you know, I'm telling you this good news, but I had heard this good news and received it myself. How that Christ died for our sins. So, Jesus died, and he did so as, you know, a sacrifice for our sins, according to the Scripture. Okay, so, Jesus is the Messiah, according to Scripture, and he's a sacrifice, according to Scripture. And that he died is what we know. And that he was buried, okay, and we know about the burial of the tomb, and that he rose again the third day, okay, and this is a historical fact, so he was historically dead three days later, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, Cephas is the um, name of Peter, so um, that's an Aramaic name, so... That's really giving you a historical context. This is a early letter of Paul. And so they're talking um, about Paul. And even though it's Greek language, he's using that Aramaic. You know, because they may have heard of him as Cephas. Then of the twelve, the twelve apostles. And that after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain, under this present, but some are falling asleep. So I talked a little bit about that, you know, about the fact that um, I think that he knew the 500 because he was a persecutor of the church and keeping records for the Sanhedrin. So he probably came across 500 witnesses through his mission persecuting Christianity. He says, um, whom the greater part remain under this present, but some are falling asleep. Now, what is he doing? He's talking to the fellow Christians and saying, look, he was seen by 500 people. And you know what? Like, some of them are still alive. Most of them are still alive. So you, you guys can, if you think I'm lying, you know, you can go back and talk to them, okay? You know, I mean, some are dead, but still, I mean, you know, but most of them are still alive, and you can go back and talk to them. After that, he was seen of James, and then all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. And so uh, Paul has had some spiritual encounters with Christ. And um, basically, he believed that this was Jesus who he was seeing. You know, um, different, different things, um, you know, kind of point to that fact. But also, um, you know, he talked to, you know, some guys who had seen Jesus face to face in Galatians. He talked to, um, he talked to Peter himself. He talked to James and I think John also. But he, he talked to the apostles and they gave him the right hand of fellowship. So that's important because 
they know that there's something kind of going on here, but like they know that what he sees is the same Jesus whom they worshipped. That's important because they they know that this guy's got it right. There are lots of false teachers that they were guarding against, but yet they know something spiritually. And I know that that doesn't make the biggest testimony for the skeptic, but um, it is a good point to know. But yeah, so um, most scholars agree that this meeting would have been early because we know that Paul was writing in the 40s. We know that he was publicly executed in the 60s. And so... Um, we know he is who he is, and the scholars agree with that. So now he's like hearing this, and, um, you know, according to the time of his testimony and different records, uh, we would think this would be probably within about six years that he had heard this message of the gospel. Okay, because the gospel happened, and then, you know, he's reacting, uh, persecuting the church for. He realizes what's going on, and this spiritual meeting has changed his entire life, you know, and it was only a spiritual meeting because, you know, otherwise, like, the rest of the guys were not convincing him. He was busy whooping him, throwing him in jail, or killing him, <laughs> okay? So, um, it was a meeting with God that changed his whole life and ended up, you know, ultimately in his execution. So, um... Let's see here. Okay, so, you know, the important things about some of the cases that I made yesterday was that John the Baptist was the proof of the Jewish corruption. Okay. John the Baptist had that reputation. His father was um, a um, Jewish priest and preacher and um, at one time had the role. I think they rotated the roles, but... Essentially, at one point, he served as the high priest, and that's when he got struck dumb, leading to, you know, his son being born and the coming of the Messiah. But, um, yeah, so it would be natural that John the Baptist was serving as the high priest, but he was a counter-priest to show that the Jewish temple had been corrupt, and for his troubles, he was killed. And so we see the corruption of the Jews with the Romans, and the fact that um, they are they covet those things that are spiritual. So this is like showing that like okay, um, these guys were bad dudes, and so they treated John poorly, which gives evidence that they were going to treat Jesus poorly. Not that Jesus had not proven who he was. Then you have Judas. Okay, uh, turned his back. He is the proof of the apostolic weakness. So the apostles could not have uh, conspired to hide the body or steal the body. Okay. Number one, if they paid off the um, Roman guards, then common sense would have said that they should have paid off the judge first and kept Jesus alive. And Judas was the money guy. <laughs> right? So if anybody knew whether they could pull off a conspiracy, it would have been Judas. And what did Judas do? Judas gave up, and he gave him up to the priest because he knew it wasn't going to work. And they didn't have the power to accomplish anything. And Judas wanted power. He wanted to have a um, theonomic ruler to rile up Israel to fight off the Romans. Uh, because he was uh, a zealot. But instead, um, push came to shove, and Jesus was not wanting to be that version of the Messiah. And so, since that happened, you know, Judas gave up and he sold him out for 26 pieces of silver. Okay. Which, you know, inflation happened. So, 26 pieces of silver, um, even in the Torah days, was um, what you would pay if an animal had gored a human slave and killed the human slave, then the owner of the animal would pay 26 pieces of silver uh, in compensation to the slave owner. 
And so obviously that's not, you know, very much anything 1,400 years before this. And now here you are and, um, you know, he's selling out Jesus Christ for chump change. So, um, yeah, so that destroys the uh, apostolic conspiracy theory. And um, then we have um, some other record later on. Uh, now, I've heard this in the past, but it's good to kind of know where this came from. So, in Eusebius' Histories, it talks about um, a uh, testimony from Tertullian. Now, Tertullian was a uh, major figure in the church. He was the first one to use the terminology of Trinity. And um, he was an apologist for the Christian faith, and back then... Uh, it meant that he was the lawyer, okay? So as the Christians were being persecuted, he would stand up in a court of law and defend the Christians. So he gave a testimony to the Roman court, uh, and he said, hey, look at this. So what this was is that the Roman emperor, who didn't have authority on the matter, was petitioning the... Um, uh, Senate. He was petitioning the Roman Senate to admit Jesus Christ into the pantheon because Pontius Pilate had gave this report of the resurrection. So we got to do something. <laughs> he said, let's appease the situation. We will make Jesus a god. Okay. And so he suggested that they didn't go along with it. But that is more evidence of the two big principles, and that is the fact that um, Rome, you know, especially what we see with Punch Pilate, is very powerful, but yet um, they're not uh, very wise. Um, let's see here. Yeah, okay. I'm trying to read my note here. Um, yeah, so, like, Pilate kind of fumbled this one, okay? Because he had the, the power, but he didn't really know how to deal with this. Which is fine, because God was going to use it for his purpose. But, um, you know, um, their, you know, back and forthness kind of shows that, like, you know, this is what can happen. So, they were trying to be even-handed, but then push came to shove, and so they, you know, decided, okay, well, we can let Barabbas go for free, but we're not going to, you know, help Jesus Christ out. And, um, you know, so now you've got this waffling situation. But in the power, um, you had these centurions guarding. Centurions are, you know, the, the elite soldiers, okay? So the elite soldiers were guarding the temple. Just like, you know, in America, we have the Green Beret or the Navy SEALs, the most elite, the, the most elite of the soldiers were out there and they were guarding. So, you know, these guys can, you know, take five or ten guys out, okay, just by themselves because they're extremely well-trained and ready for the most deadliest of combat. And that would be where the Centurions were kind of coming from. And you would have, around Mount Moriah, you would have, you know, four at the north, four at the side, four at the other side, four at the other side. So you would have the apostles, and um, the apostles are not going to beat these guys in a fight. If the four were having trouble, then they could get the other 16 to kind of come out with them. But um, the apostles are not trained warriors. I mean, they're not utter weaklings, you know, they were fishermen, they were decently strong, but they didn't know what to do with it. And um, when the combat that we see was when, um, you know, I think it was Marcus, or Malchus, who um, Peter goes and he attacks Malchus, tries to kill him with a sword, and instead he chops off his ear. <laughs> so Jesus chastises him and heals the guy's ear. Obviously, you know, Peter was not a warrior, okay? So, um, they couldn't, they couldn't have pulled it off. 
and you know they couldn't pay him off either so you know we're we're sitting there back with this thing of you know uh in a courtroom and how do we handle this in a historian sense well the modernists are trying to recreate history in their image and so they'll talk about you need all these qualifications for something to be admitted as historical fact but you know in justice in the justice system we see something different um, you are innocent until proven guilty if someone sees something then it's understood as a fact as long as logic hasn't knocked it down so you know um, we have the uh, observations. We've got four direct sources on Jesus Christ. And we have the records of their resurrection. And by the way, I should mention uh, the resurrection of um, Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus predict predicts his um, death, burial, and resurrection. The um, testimony of his resurrection is erased in some manuscripts and people have blown that way out of proportion um and the fact is is that like not only are there you know some people who can't copy a manuscript down uh there's a lot of these letters that were publicly burned okay uh but in the gospel of mark his account of the resurrection that's Mark 16, 9 through 20. Um, it is in 99, over 99% of the manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark in the Greek. Over 99% are all testifying to this text as God's Word and as part of Mark. Um, there's two that stand against it. Uh, that is Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Um, they are categorized as what we call Alexandrian documents. So they all come from one source. It's not Israel. Okay. It's in Egypt where there's a lot of crazy, you know, um, heretical doctrines going on. There's confusion with the ancient mythical religions. So their scribes have a higher probability of confusing the details. They, they, they take the Bible allegorically. But we're not done yet. Uh, there's three major documents, uh, major New Testament texts that are cat categorized this way. The third one is Codex Alexandrinus. Now, Codex Alexandrinus does have Mark chapter 16, 9 through 20. And that's everywhere. Now, there is some followers. Uh, you had these guys, Clement Alexandria, then Origen, who studied under Clement. And then, um, I think it's Eusebius did also study indirectly under Origen, maybe a gener generation or two away, in Caesarea. Well, his Caesarean text has some of the resurrection account, but it's all altered and summarized. But Codex uh, Sinaiticus um, has been in recent years um, been criticized. And um, when it came out in the public, as far as like the, aware the discovery of Sinaiticus, there was a man who was famous for forging documents. He, he did some archaeology. Okay, he, he could do that, but he also did forge documents. And he publicly said that he forged Sinaiticus. He probably, um, as some further research has been done, uh, he probably was uh, working from a text that his um, uh, uncle had collated. So, um, his uncle Benedict of Athos. But basically, um, so now we have a testimony. We didn't have a testimony where that thing came from, okay? But yet newspapers reported this back in the 1800s. And they just kind of ignored it. And they said, oh, you're a liar because you forge things. But he forges things is why they say he's a liar. 
So, okay, well, if he said that he forged it, and he's a forger, doesn't that make sense? Well, then you have, um, what was it? Either, um, I could get this wrong. So there's Vaticanus, and then there's uh, Sinaiticus. Vaticanus is not necessarily that old as been thought. One of them, I guess it's still Sinaiticus, that has the um, Mark 16 where there's a big giant empty place where it looks like things got erased. Okay, so it could be that the whole uh, resurrection account was actually erased from the document. And I know that Bible versions have said the oldest and the best manuscripts, but they're not the best. They're very tattered. They're very messy, and the chain of custody is really poor. Okay. Um, you also have uh, Irenaeus, I think Hippolytus maybe, who also quote it before the earliest dating of the Sinaiticus. So if you believed in the earliest dating as said the Sinaiticus was an ancient Bible document, then the um, these anti-Nicene church fathers actually quote Mark 16, 19 as scripture and as Bible prophecy. Irenaeus puts it as Bible prophecy in his book 6. And um, this is all going on before that, all right? So, you know, even before the second century, they were already saying this is in the Bible, okay? So it's extremely solid and obvious that uh, Mark 16 does speak of the resurrection and has that full resurrection account. So, you know, now you're back to that point, um, you know, now you're back to ground zero. And here it is. It's a fact. Uh, as I said, the next couple uh, lessons that I'll, I'll give will reinforce that fact as well uh, in a theological way. But um, we have to understand that, like, there's really no alternative, you know, the, the theories to counter a straightforward reading, uh, reading of the resurrection fall apart you know i mean you, you, you tie both hands and feet behind their back and they're still there that you still can't get rid of these things so here's the truth there is no alternative theory it's just true okay two or three witnesses they've got over 500 and then you talk about the apostles and then you talk about that empty tomb it's just a fact so um, we'll go ahead and cut off there and we'll go further later.